So this bit's being added in post. During editing, I discovered that there was a small problem with my microphone and all my audio sounded like this. And that is just not right. I did manage to fix it to a certain extent using audio processing, but it's still not great. Apologies for the poor audio quality. And now, back to our main feature. So last time I got to the point of getting the calibration tool running, but then ran into lots of issues with crashes and weird things with the multiplication and so on. I think I've managed to sort those out. Uh, I've switched to a different libc. This is libc mini. Uh, this produces TOS binaries, which are much smaller than the ones that the Mint tool chain was producing by like a factor of 10. Uh, these do seem to run. I've also discovered a issue where EmuTOS gets confused if there are long file name files on the SD card. So removing those has made things better. I think what I was seeing last time was it was failing to load binaries properly due to this issue which was why I was getting the crashes. And with that done, I managed to fix another bunch of things, one of which was uh, the fact that the actual calibration coefficients are long, 32-bit wide. The coordinates we get from the touchscreen are 16 bits, so this multiplication was overflowing and causing bad things to happen. Uh, the solution there is that since the values that we get out of the touch screen are 12 bits, but we're actually reading 16, we just, you know, drop the, the bottom four bits and that keeps everything in range. So now I can actually show you if I do Control Z and run the calibration routine. Uh, this is now dumping, it's full of debug information, but these are the calibration coefficients. This is what the kernel is seeing, this is what the calibration tool is seeing, so it, the data is actually making it through intact. So exit back to gem, and you should be able to see the mouse pointer moving with the stylus. Unfortunately, if we move towards the edge of the screen, you may notice that it drifts away from the stylus somewhat and starts moving rather glitchily. You notice it's going diagonally even though I'm moving the pen up and down. And likewise, if you go over to the left, That movement is not right. And if you look over at the console here, X and Y are the raw values from the touchscreen shifted right by 4 bits. So you can see that these correspond directly to the voltage. So you can see it increases going left, X, up to about 1200. And then it starts dropping back again. And that is just not right. So the screen appears to be somewhat non-linear. In the middle of the screen, it's more or less all right. Like I can open menus and things. So that's nice. with a certain amount of difficulty. Uh, can I... Trying to get down to the bottom of the screen is hard, so I can't actually click on the cancel button. It just doesn't go down, go that far down, so I have to press return instead. However, anything on the left is not working, and anything on the right is not working. And you may notice that if I touch repeatedly,
the pointer is jittering around quite a lot. So if you remember looking at the uh, decompile touchscreen code from the Palmos ROM, there was a lot of logic in there, and I think that was all due, due to smoothing touchscreen in order to get reasonable, reasonably accurate touches. I could certainly take multiple samples and average them together, that's not very difficult. But I'm more worried about the left and right side. You see, if I throw the switch in the board, reset, this then boots up Palmos. So then we go to the Palmos calibration, which is the same as my calibration, it uses different targets. So here, here, here. Oh look, it's asking for the top left target again. And again. So, it does eventually accept it. So I've actually been trying for several minutes to make that work and it's not. So it's not behaving at the moment. This used to work. I think I have managed to somehow damage the touchscreen probably by disassembling things. I have taken it apart and put it back together again, tried to reseat everything. And it's still not behaving. Uh, I did manage to make it skip the calibration at one point, but I can't remember how. You had to reset it at the right moment. So that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, okay, it's it's... It has now skipped the calibration, but of course the, the pen won't work because it doesn't know how to get how to map coordinates. So this touch screen code here, I mean there's some stuff I could do with it. I could take like three samples and average them that might help. But it's not going to do anything with the non-linearity of the screen, so uh um I am not really sure what else I can do with this. Let's actually just do that uh so. Let's take let's take eight samples. And this is going to simply be like so. And let's give that a try and see what it does. If the middle of the screen works reasonably well, then it should at least be usable. So we throw the switch back again. The switch just see there controls the uh, line that tells the six eight three two eight whether to boot into debug mode or into uh, or to do a normal palm off boot. That's not working. There we go. Um, just a small loose wire problem. But uh, let's see if this works, and then I'm going to call the touchscreen driver done. It needs work. I'm not sure what work is remains to be done there. I would like somebody with a different device to test it to see whether it's actually a problem with my screen or not, which is a shame. I hope that I haven't damaged the screen by miscontrolling it. That shouldn't be possible, really. I mean... 
if I have to configure the touchscreen controller for things like voltages and I'm using the wrong ones, it's possible, but very unlikely. But anyway, let's see how this goes. And then there is only one remaining piece of work needing to be done. And I can call the first alpha of this finished. So let's get onto that. And I'm just trying to fill time while the download happens. Okay. I've turned the backlight on because it makes things easier to see. So. Uh, what did I call it? Dana Cal. Okay. So now how does the mouth point to me? Weirdly is the answer. It's smoother. It's not really smoother. That's glitching about horribly all over the place. It occurs to me that uh, If the pen has come up while taking out eight samples, the values are going to be, the values we're getting back are going to be garbage and are so going to pull off the position. So I think we want to do, um, So if let's try that. So what we're doing is we're sampling the pen down line before and after taking our coordinates and only if uh, the pen is down both times do we trust the sample we're getting. So if the pen comes up between, while doing a sample we ignore it. Yeah let's try that. I have in fact done a bit of refactoring so that the sampling code is now in raw read, which should help a bit. So let's see what this does. Now, okay. Well, judging by the way that the printer icon bottom right has been selected, I don't think that smoothie is working well, and I will hope it won't. It's pretty jerky, but the main reason for that is all the tracing that's being produced. Hmm. Uh, that's interesting. That has, in fact, just read via 
So these values are actually the addresses of the state variables, not the result. So let's just put this here instead. Uh, so the x equals y equals is actually coming from here. x and y are the values that we've fetched. And sx and sy are the screen coordinates. I mean, these are clearly wrong. That means that n is up. So... Okay, if the pen comes up before any of the samples, then it will return 0 and 0, and the state will be not pressed. So... Uh, let us... do this. So we check to see if the uh, the pointer is down. If it is, we try to do a sample. This will then return whether the pointer is, whether the pen is still down afterwards. So that will tell us whether the sample we've just read is valid. Okay, so let's try calibrating. Uh, interesting. Why is the raw read not now returning and down? Um, it is possible that this is actually connected to the touchscreen chip's interrupt line. So this may not be returning whether the pen's down. It may be returning whether the data pending. It's not the same thing. Uh, it's not that one. This one. This is the data sheet. So the output pin is pen IRQ, pen interrupt. Pen out the IOQ output is connected to the wider input. When the panel is touched, the pen IOQ output goes low. During the measurement cycles, the output diode will be internally connected to ground and wiper is disconnected. Uh, okay, and that's power down mode. So 
So as far as I can tell... Uh, pen IOQ will be low while doing these, while sampling, or when the panel is touched and high otherwise. So, that should work as far as I'm aware. Interesting. So, have I got something wrong here? Uh, state here is a U word. This would want to be this. Actually, actually, we'll put this here. I know what the problem was. I think I know what the problem was. Um, no, that was not the problem. So what I was thinking of is that this is that rules and words are not necessarily equivalent, depending on the version of C. If it's a real bool, then values will be coerced to 0 or 1 when they're assigned. If it's just an int, and of course state here is now a word, a pointer to a word, then uh, it won't be. So this will return either, uh, this thing will return either 0 or 2. Not will then produce either uh, 1 or Zero. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm getting this confused with complement, which is wrong. So yeah, that should work. Interesting. So, let's run that again, shall we? Date is always zero being returned from the well then we'll read. But then we get a zero value. I do not think that this line is behaving the way I think it's behaving. Given that we seem to be getting We're not getting zeros from uh, as samples if the pen is up. Uh, we're getting zeros because uh, this condition is failing and it's not actually reading anything. And so the initial values here are applied. I'm just going to deploy this. But I think what's happening is that we're reading the... Uh, is that... 
doing the read is somehow causing state to go high. Uh, so it thinks it's not pressed. Okay, so we run it. Okay, that does seem to be behaving now. And we then we're not getting still a bit jittery, it's still quite a lot jittery actually. But it's not highlighting the printer icon anymore. Uh, and, but yes, we still have... We still have terrible results the right hand side of the screen. Moderately bad results in the center. And the left hand side of the screen is garbage. Fabulous. Well, I think that's better, so let's just stick with it. We should just turn off the. turn off that tracing. I do want to turn off this. And I'll try that again without the tracing at all, just to make sure it behaves the same way. Okay. I'm hoping the mouse pointer will be a bit smoother now. Calibrate. Yes, it's smoother. Not very well calibrated, I have to say. This is probably due to a glitchy press when I actually did the calibration. The calibration tool could probably be enhanced with more averaging. Let's try that. Yeah, that's better. You see, this bit is alright. But going up and down, it goes sideways hugely. Anyway, anyway, I think that's fine. It's not very happy, but there we go. All right. Well, this takes us on to the other part, and I shall just fire this thing back up in Palmos. The other thing, the last thing remaining to do is... I don't really want people to have to rig up a development board like this and solder stuff onto their device in order to run the run Emutos. So I'm going to try and do some Palmos programming and try and write a very simple tool that will load a uh, Emutos kernel from the SD card and run it. So I believe that resetting here will take it to the We'll skip the calibration. Now that takes us straight into the calibration. Hey, it calibrated! That's a stroke of luck. Good. Well. So... 
I have here hello world in Palmos code. No, that's hello world in VDI code. Here is hello world in Palmos code. So we run it with, or we compile it with, Palmos uh, GCC minus C minus OS minus G hello dot C. Uh, that does the actual compilation. We then we need to uh, turn the object file into a resource file. Let me go and look this up, shall I? Okay, here it is. I did actually have the right command line. Uh, ah, this wants minus o hello, and this wants ah ah. I need I need an executable. So no minus c. Right. That then turns this executable into a resource file. I'm not quite sure what a resource file looks like. Hello.grook. But then we run build prook here that uh, reads that in. Right, these are the resource files created, for which there are a number. Uh, build prook then reads these and it turns it into a parmos prook file. Just one of these. And we then put this onto the SD card in the right place. So mount the SD card. Uh, we then need to create the directory structure needed that's annoying. And then we copy the prop file into the launcher directory. Then we unmount it. And then when we insert the card into the machine, It should use an error message. Um, so uh, it's supposed to understand DOS file systems on SD cards, but this has been uh, configured for a uh, for the for Emutos. It's possible that Parmos doesn't like it. But Parmos does appear to be a little bit flaky. Let's try any other card slot. Fantastic! Well, that's a lot of help. Um. I'm going to have to figure out how to produce a card that both Emutos and Parmos understand. That's going to be annoying. I'll be back in a moment. Okay, it took a while, but here we go. Uh, there is our hello application, so if I run it. There it says hello world, which is good. So what I eventually did is the Emutos card is in the right hand slot and the, that's the Emutos card and that's the Parmos card because of course this machine has two card slots which is nice. So we are now running code in Parmos. So let's try and turn this into something a bit more useful. 
Um, so let's copy this into tool, we can call this Dana run.c. Uh, we are, this is going to be really, really hacky so that we don't actually need a event loop or anything. What we're going to do is attempt to open a file on the SD card, uh, which will contain our ROM image, load it into memory, and then run it. So I am going to go and have to have a look at the Palmos. Uh, actually, I've got the Palm SDK here. So which version of Palmos do we have? Probably four. So in here there should be some file handling code. Here yeah, this looks plausible. Uh, probably don't want palm compatibility dot h yeah I'm actually going to have to go and look this up I think Interesting that these do not actually be able to be defined anywhere. Possibly the uh yes. I wonder if there's stuff missing I need. Okay, I am gonna go look this up. So I found this PDF of the Palmos 5 API and there's a nice set of VFS functions. So I think the one we want is VFS file open, but this takes a volume reference number. Uh, so we're going to have to call this to enumerate the volumes. We're going to try and look for our kernel on every volume, because that means that we can put it on uh, in either card slot. So, VFS uh, volume enumerate uh, pointer to the reference number pointer to variable that holds the index ah, example code, perfect You. Okay. Uh, UN16. Uh, we have to use the Palmos types, I suppose. UN16 volume reference number. UN32 volume iterator start. Oops. No, it's BFS iterator start. And then we have a loop. While vi is not equal to vfs iterator stop uh, arrow e equals vfs volume 
enumerate volume reference volume iterator e is not equal to error none okay so if we get here then we have a valid volume so let's go to the FS file open taking the volume reference the path the open mode is one of these and we want VFS mode read and and that's all we need Go back to here and we want a return file ref so if e hang on where's the numerate gone this is the wrong sense here so if e equals error none as is it's found a kernel.image file then we are going to try to load it. So first we want to figure out how big the file is. So E equals VFS file size, file reference followed by 52 size, followed by the size. Uh, If E is a none, that succeeds. Actually, if it doesn't succeed, we're going to fail. When we fail, we are going to close our file. And the only reason that this would fail is if the file was unreadable. Uh, at which point we want to loop round, want to close the temporary file reference, loop round to the next volume. So we should here now have a correct size. So we want, um, I looked this up earlier, mem pointer new. Uh, Right, I was going to say that we would use this to allocate the size of our size block of memory, but it looks like we can't, because there's a limit of 64k for a block. Um. Uh. Is there a way to get more memory than this? I don't think this is it. What's this? No, that's not relevant. Okay, this is a little bit of a problem because if we can't allocate enough memory for to, to put our kernel in, then we can't load it. It's got to be a conti contiguous memory block. I wonder if we're allowed to use large chunks of BSS. So could we just do uh, putting u int eight is Correct. So 256k. So if you compile this with Dana run to D, 
sustain a run. Uh, integer overflow. That makes me think that these are using 16 bit ints, which is. Yeah, it looks like our BSS can only be. Um, 64k. Hmm. That's a bit annoying. Okay, uh, more research is required, I think. Okay, so this is actually a little bit more interesting than I was really expecting. There seems to be no way to allocate large chunks of memory, so I'm going to have to work with... Uh, it says the maximum size of a memory allocation is a bit under 64k, so let's work with 32k. So, block size is 32 now we are going to need to allocate enough blocks to load our file and then read the file into these blocks one at a time. Then once we've finished with Parmos, we turn interrupts off so that now none of the Parmos code is executing and then we have to reassemble this all of our blocks into one contiguous chunk and jump to the beginning of it. Luckily, I've already done the work so that the ROMs are um, position-independent code. So what we're going to do is... Uh, so for... So let's say the biggest kernel can be uh, 300k, say. So that will be, we will need this many blocks. So we now know how big the file is. So let's calculate the number of blocks. Check the uh, unit 16. We are now going to allocate them Okay, does this compile? Uh, I bet that's a U8 Are there a few blocks? Uh, U sixteen is a type. Wait, this compiler doesn't un doesn't know C ninety nine. Yikes. Okay. That was a shock. And that's not going to be unavailable either. Okay. Line uh, 32. Oh, that should be blocks. I okay. Subscriptive value is neither array nor pointer. Uh, Okay, now 
we are actually going to sort our list of blocks by pointer so that they are in ascending order. This will make it easier to reassemble them again later. So uh, size of blocks. I oh, know it's number of members is block count. The size of each member is that and the comparator is comparator CV. Now I'm not sure yet whether Palmos has a comparator has a Q sort, but uh oops. One point two uh, the first element is less than ten minus one greater than return 1, otherwise return 0. Okay. No Q sort. Do we have a sort? Um, I also found this, which is palmloader.c. It's the UC Linux loader for starting UC Linux on Palm devices. Uh, however, this works rather differently than my code, so cursors. I do not see a sort in the index anywhere. System function. Ah, sysq sort. Excellent. Here. Passing arg four from that's the comparator. This wants to be an int sixteen. We are not const. Excellent. Okay, well that will sort the blocks into ascending order. Um, we can now go through and actually read the data. So, FS file read. Uh, number of lights to read, point of the destination, block, okay. So this would be VSS file read, file reference, block size, blocks, I, and we don't care about those number of bytes read, that uh, still builds. Right, so at this point we now have our entire file in memory. We want to uh, reassemble it into a contiguous block. Now, it is possible that our code here that we're running from is actually between two of the blocks. So we can't just overwrite 
uh, random stuff because you might overwrite the code we're actually running. So, what's a good way to do this? Uh, we could have a piece of position independent code do the work, which we copy into one of our allocated blocks. We allocate an extra block. That way we know that um, we won't be overwriting it. Because, of course, our blocks are now in numerical order, so that we know that between uh, blocks zero and blocks however big our kernel is, there will be at least that much memory. So... How do we do this? Uh, I think we're going to need some position independent code. We're also going to, however, this code will need access to our array of blocks, which again might be between two of these. So yeah, we are going to need to do that. Can I file this? Uh, no, we can't. So we're going to have to write machine code manually. Okay, so if we do that, that means that we'll allocate one extra block. This is going to contain our actual boot code. I wonder if I want to try and load the boot code from a file as well. For ease of development. Uh, actually, trying to write it in here would be tricky. There is inline assembly. Yeah, let's do that. So, uh, so close the current file. Load the new file. Um, at this point, we can't really clean up. I mean, we could free all the blocks, but uh, we're pretty much into it's going to work or the system will crash territory. So let's just read in our boot block into the last block. We want to make sure that that is included in the sort list. We uh, We are going to define a function pointer, which is going to be our boot code. Uh, 
uh, assign it to the last block and execute. That compile. Oh yeah. Um, and it's taking as parameters the a pointer to the list of blocks and the number of blocks. Excellent. So does this actually, what, what does it look like if we disassemble it? And did I move it to, yeah, I did do my um, minus G, so. So here's our main function, which is this, which is quite small. These are where uh, we're calling palm off system calls. Each one is a, uh, a trap followed by uh, the number of the system call you want to call. Uh, so we are here calling Q sort. Which I think is this. Uh, we are now calling, it's probably the loop, yeah. This is a multiplication by four. These three calls here will be file close, file open, or file read. Um, So after file read, we that's weird. So this is this file read because it's then got the uh, the bottom of the loop in it. So file close, file open, file read, oh yeah, and this is our, uh, our code here. Here is the indirect jump being done. Okay, so I think that code is possibly right. There's nothing resembling tracing, so we won't know if anything goes wrong. And we also need to uh, write this. So let's do a little bit of rearrangement. This needs to be a directory, so move. Tools, you know, run dot c run touch tools palm boot dot s equals to list of blocks plus four equals number of blocks speed plus zero equals turn address. So um, first thing we need to do is turn interrupts off, so that's going to be and steal the code from here. 
uh, log w right, 2700 into sr. Uh, okay, Harmos now doesn't get a chance to do anything. We are then going to load uh, what that to be a 32 bit value. That's the point of such a 32 bit value. So, D0 is the number of blocks. Okay, so we're actually going to want to loop until uh, D naught until we've run out of blocks. But we're actually going to start at uh. At block one, of course, block Z. Well, okay, let me let me just back up a little. What we're going to do? So, uh, we have blocks like 0, 1, 2, and 3 with gaps in between. What we're going to do is we're going to copy block 1 so it immediately follows block 0, block 2 so it immediately follows the new location of block 1, etc. So, uh, that way we will end up with all the blocks concatenated together and we know that there will be enough memory for them and they were not overwriting anything we care about. We're only overwriting like Parmos stuff. So uh, this is going to be the current block we're working with. Uh, No, we don't need to do it like that. Okay, first we need to find our destination address. So this is going to be the thing pointed at at A0. Uh, So what we are going to do is we need to figure out whether we ran out of blocks. So we are going to compare our block number with 1. If it is equal to 1, then we uh, are finished. We could put this comparison at the end, but if we did that, then we wouldn't be able to support uh, ROMs that were in a single block. We'd always end up copying at least one block. So, we now...
this plus will cause a0 to be incremented by 4 as we read it. So it is now pointing So it is now pointing at the pointer pointing at the current block. Oh blast, this isn't going to work. Because this block address array is uh, going to be in um, unsafe memory. We could be overwriting it. We're going to have to copy that into uh, safe memory. Rat. So, uh, we know we've got thirty two K in this in the block that this code lives in. So we can just put it there. That's lots. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is to copy the entire block array. So that will be I don't need to do that using the these. Uh, it's not even going to be there, it's going to be here. So dbf is a little bit odd as you need to subtract one from the loop counter. So let's just do it the old fashioned way. So that will be sub q1 from d1 branch if not zero to one. Okay. So This then picks up the address of the first block Okay, so we should be ready We now want to compare We enter our main loop we want to pick up the address of the block that we're going to copy. Actually, there's an easier way to do this. So this will write a zero after the list of block pointers. We now no longer need the number of blocks. So all we're going to do is to
pick up the new source block. If it's zero, we've finished. Then we are going to actually do the copying. I copy from the source to the destination dbf one one back. Right. That's copied. It has advanced our destination address. So here, all we need to do is jump back to the loop. Right, once we have finished, we just need to get the first address, which is going to be That's the address of the first block. So this is the address of the first array slot, which contains the address of the first block. This gets the address of the first block. This jumps to it. So this should be our reassembly code. Uh, I think I'm actually going to use the Atari assembler for this as it's rather newer. It doesn't matter, it's going to be creating a um, a simple image like this. Yep. 46 jump C0. Okay. So now let's just disassemble it to see whether it looks sensible. I did put that in the wrong directory. Uh, Okay, so now let's assemble it. So interrupts off. Um, I'm checking for any uh, absolute um, refer uh, address references because, of course, they will work. Number of logs, block address array. Uh, this is program counter relative, so that's fine. Yeah, all the Okay. Uh, it does occur to me that we could turn this into a 
um, into data that then that gets embedded into our program here. That would probably be better than having a separate file, to be honest. We are going to want to make Dana run .brook, which will depend on um, of Dana run. And our command line for creating it is Oldbrook This is the application ID, which is a four character uh, identifier. Uh, and uh, not keen on that, to be honest. One of the problems of make, one of the many, many problems of make is trying to deal with rules that generate multiple output files. And uh, this is one of them. So let's actually do it like this. Let's take a Parmas of res. Have a destination directory, okay? CD of and okay. So this will then spit out all the .grc files, which this will then consume. So now all we need to do is do this. First input file, output file. Okay. Ah. Tools in a run make file. Okay, it has compiled the exe, but this hasn't found it. Uh, it. Okay, so that has now created a executable, which is uh, Dana run .crook, I believe. All right, so that compiled the program. Uh, we now need to compile the loader.
which we're going to be using this Atari Mint AS All right. Um, we do also need a image. And we create this with... I'm actually doing this in the Dana code. We're doing it here. So this will be n 6 k Atari Mint LD Arch Arm Boot. Position independent. So I don't think. Hmm. I do need to tell it that I want it to generate an output file. So I think I want this. Just stick this in to make sure it gets built. See what happens. Okay, we have um, what is it? Nine eight nine is big. Right, that is in fact generated a mint executable, which is not what we want. Yeah, this specifies the format of input files. We want to specify the format of output files. There may not be an option for this. Here we go, O format. O format binary. Let's see what that does. Uh, that's better. That looks about the right size. Uh, it shouldn't matter what the start address is because it's position independent. Um, Six FC four six FC hello yep at the bottom we've got four e d zero and then zero is good right we have we have built our bootloader we now want to get it into our Dana run program the simplest way of doing that is. Use XXD. Uh, XSD does a hex dump, and it's got an option that will emit a C include file. So we can do
that. Or we can do that. H depends on on image. Okay, so this depends on palm boot dot h. Okay. So here we have our bootloader. This means instead of this code, all we need to do is to copy the destination is blocks block count, source is bootloader, the length is size of bootloader. We can get rid of this. doesn't it like about that? Maybe that would help. Alright, implicit declaration of built-in function mem copy. Um, let's take a look to see whether there's a System functions. Uh, doesn't look like there's a mem copy, so probably we just want to include string.h. And there we go. Okay, so our Here is our proc file. So, to make sure we have a working Dana ROM. Okay, the card is in the slot, so if we copy Dana run .proc into mount palm launcher and inutos.image into mount kernel image so that will copy so we insert the card Wait for it to be mounted. Uh, it does. I have noticed it does not actually appear to be showing the application. Did I remember to change everything? It should, it should be called Dana Run. So let's just see whether it actually made it onto the card. No, it didn't.
Kilia. So we, we insert the card, we wait for it to mount. And there is our Dana run program, so we run it. And it doesn't work. Which honestly I was expecting. Okay. So, uh, the next job is to figure out why it doesn't work. And to do that, I'm probably need, going to need to get out a Palmos emulator with a debugger attached to it. Uh, so, I am going to leave that till next time. So, I hope you enjoyed this video, and please let me know what you think in the comments.